Welcome back to Sports World here on TRT World. Gus Hiddink has quit as head coach of the Netherlands after less than a year in charge. Uh, Hiddink took over the Dutch national side for a second time after last summer's World Cup, but they've won less than half of his get, uh, 10 games in charge. They also face a challenge to be at next year's uh, European Championships in France, where uh, they're currently third in their qualifying group. Hiddink has said it's a real pity things uh, worked out like this. It, but that it was an honour to be the national coach again. His assistant, uh, Danny Blind, father, of course, of Manchester United midfielder Daly, will take over as coach. So let's uh, take a look then uh, in full at Hiddink's uh, time in charge. He won just four of his ten games, drawing once. That was against Turkey and losing uh, five times, including matches against Iceland and the Czech Republic. Now, Petr Cech has called the decision to leave Chelsea the hardest of his career, but he joins Arsenal uh, with the ambition to win more trophies, including the Premier League. Cech completed his move from Chelsea to Arsenal yesterday for a fee of around uh, 14 million euros. He's revealed he made his mind up to uh, make the switch across London after speaking uh, with Arsene Wenger. Cech won four Premier League titles and the Champions League during his time at Stamford Bridge and believes his new side are capable of achieving similar things. I spoke to the manager Arsene Wenger and Obviously, that was the that was the big uh, big difference because, as I said, uh, I'm as hungry as ever, and uh, I have the same commitment and motivation to win trophies uh, as I had 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and or as a kid. And um, as, you know, having spoken to him, uh, I, I believe that uh, I, I will find it here. I've, I will find a team which wants to be successful and and uh, which want to challenge the the best teams in, in Europe. And, and I think this is. Uh, exciting projects for me. Probably the hardest decision for me to go, but uh, as I said, uh, I believe that last year I, I realized that uh, I'm not in a phase of my career where I would, uh, I would sit on the bench and I want to be playing, I want to have a chance to compete for my position in the team and Arsenal is a team who challenge for the top and uh, it definitely matches my ambitions and personal motivation and and I believe that uh, at this time of my career, I, I, uh, I made a good choice and I will have uh, the success uh, I'll, I would love to have. Now to the latest on what could be one of the biggest transfer deals of the summer and the future of Sergio Ramos. Manchester United have reportedly tabled a bid of over 40 million euros and Ramos apparently keen to accept. Now the Real Madrid defender currently has two years left to run on his current deal and supposedly is determined to leave the Bernabeu and move to join a Louis van Gaal's project at Old Trafford. Well, for more on this developing transfer story, our reporter Adam Reid uh, joins me now. So do we really think Ramos leaving Spain could happen? It looks increasingly likely, Matt. Uh, it, supposedly, he's had a massive fallen out with the Real Madrid president, Florentino Perez. And as you say, he's now determined to leave. And Manchester United looks like the most likely destination. He's intrigued by the Premier League. He's played in Champions League games against Manchester United. He's even played against Liverpool. And he's really interested to see what Manchester United have to offer. And a bit of €40 million Euros looks a good start, starting point. It does come as a little bit of a surprise, though, that he is he's going to leave because he's a real fan's favourite. Real. He's one of their captains. He's been there over 10 years. But Manchester United supposedly are looking to match his ambitions. He's 29 now and he's really thinking about that next move. So, you know, if you're a Manchester United fan, what, what sort of player could they look forward to seeing? Put simply, Matt, I'd just say he's a winner. He's won uh, three La Liga titles. He's won the Champions League, part of the side that won La Decima. He's even won uh, the World Cup and he's won two European Championships. Um, he's been known as a goal-scoring defender. As you can see there, 58 times he's found the net, never afraid to come forward for set pieces and for corners. But look at that stat at the bottom there. An unwanted La Liga record <laughs> for Ramos. 19 times he's been sent off in his career. So it's not all completely good news, but as you can see, he's a, a top player. Uh, man, you have had a few problems in defence over the last couple of seasons, haven't they? How does he compare to, to the current defence they have? Well, the current defence they have is uh, it, it, it's mixed, but they arguably haven't really replaced Nemanja Vidic and Rio Ferdinand. Ramos coming in as a player with the reputation that he's got as a, a top, top player. You've got Chris... Uh, 
Chris Smalling and Phil Jones at the club at the moment, they form something of a partnership but always seem to find themselves being shifted to other positions. Then you've got Marcus Rojo and Johnny Evans. They come in and out of the side. One thing you can be sure of, if Sergio Ramos does make it to Old Trafford, he will be one of the first names in that centre-back partnership. OK, one to watch over the next few months for sure. Now, a new era began at Borussia Dortmund on Tuesday as coach Thomas Tuchel took his first training session as manager. The former Mainz coach replaces Jurgen Klopp, of course, who left the club after a seven-year reign which delivered two Bundesliga titles and a Champions League final. 41-year-old Tuchel has signed a three-year deal at Borussia and now has the challenge of uh, getting Dortmund back to the top of German football after, remember, they finished seventh in the Bundesliga last season. Now, it's semi-final time at the Women's World Cup later as Germany meet the USA in Montreal. The Americans were beaten finalists four years ago but haven't won the tournament since 1999. Germany are the competition's top scorers and are looking to impress on the biggest stage after, well, disappointment on home soil four years ago when, you might remember, they were knocked out at the quarter-final stage. The scene is set for two powerhouses of the women's game. They don't get much bigger than the top-ranked team against the world number two. But there can be only one winner. I mean, obviously, we're thrilled to be in the semi-finals, um, playing a tremendous opponent in Germany, um, which we haven't faced in, I think, uh, at least maybe a couple of years. Um, obviously, they're a terrific team, and I think it's going to be a fantastic match. Um, two, two great teams worthy of a, of a semi-final matchup. For many of the US side, this tournament is the last chance for World Cup glory. Beaten finalists four years ago, they hope to go one better in Canada. But standing in their way, a side who've looked almost unbeatable up until this point. It's almost like a final in itself. Uh, Germany's had a great run this tournament and um, we've done pretty dang well and, and have been continuing to um, get better and better throughout the tournament, I think. so. I think it's you know it's going to be a great game tomorrow for the fans and uh, we you know we've been watching Germany a lot this last this tournament knowing that we could very well see them in the semifinal and days finally come tomorrow and uh, we will be ready. Germany have impressed over the last couple of weeks, scoring 20 goals along the way, more than any other side. But they needed a penalty shootout to overcome France in the last round. Sind gegen Frankreich. We had a little bit of trouble finding our way against France. That was not good. We want to do much better against the US. We want to be more agile right from the off. We want to be much more robust in our challenges. We want to be braver, go up and down the field and play our game. We just want to leave a good impression and show we're headed right from the kickoff. One advantage the US will have in Montreal is huge support, with fans expected to pour over the border. But there's little to choose between the battle of the two-time World Cup winners. One of the most successful jump racing horses in the history of the sport has died. Corto's star has been put down after suffering neck and pelvis injuries in a fall. The gelding won 23 of his 41 races, including five uh, King George V chases and two Cheltenham Gold Cups. 15-year-old moved to a dressage after retiring from racing in 2012. Paul Nicholas, uh, who trained a Corto to his uh, famous victories, tweeted, RIP, my friend, you were a true legend once in a lifetime. Corto star became the first horse to regain the Gold Cup after losing it to Denman in 2008 and also made history by winning a fifth King George V chase uh, in 2011. Sebastian Vettel put on a bit of a show for Ferrari fans in Hungary on Monday. Thousands turned up to see him burn up the hunger-roaring circuit. Formula One rules banned drivers from testing at a track before the race. A Vettel drove Ferrari's 2012 model instead in Budapest. A Vettel is proving the strongest opposition to the dominant Mercedes pair uh, this year. He's uh, the only driver other than Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg, to have won a race. He has also had four podium places, including a second place at Monaco. Uh, he drove around the track, took part in a, a pit stop demonstration, as you can see there, and treated uh, the crowds to a series of burnouts and so-called donuts on the straight. Now to a landmark announcement for cricket, and it was confirmed that Australia will host the first day-night test match when they play New Zealand at the Adelaide Oval at the end of November. A pink ball will be used to help visibility, but traditional whites will still be worn. As part of the break with tradition, the lunch and tea intervals between sessions will now be renamed tea 
and Done. dinner. Finally, to a, a cracking sport, it certainly takes some beating and well leaves competitors feeling a little scrambled. Still with me? Francis Maguire reports on the World Egg Throwing Championships. Now, well, it seems a bit crowded at this An egg-centric contest is taking place in the English village of Swatton. The annual World Egg Throwing Championships has contestants tossing and catching raw eggs at increasing distances. It's believed that the game originated around 1322, when a local abbot, the only person who had chickens, encouraged church attendance by giving out eggs. When the river flooded and prevented parishioners from attending church, monks are said to have thrown the eggs across the river to them. This year, a German pair was thoroughly beaten by the British team made up of Richard Gutzel and Michael Speakman. It's one-handed catch to try and take the speed out of it and to reduce it. If you try and catch it, it just explodes, so it's one-handed. But then it's all down to the thrower, honestly. If you can't throw it that far, then we're never going to win, are we? Also part of the event is the Russian egg roulette, where two players take turns to pick from six eggs, five boiled and one raw. It's a lot more harmless than the original game and proves in the end that one contestant is no egghead. Francis Maguire, TRT World. What an excellent sport. It really does look rather cracking, doesn't it? Sorry about that. More sport throughout the day here on TRT World, but that's just about it for this edition of Sports World. I'm Matt Goodrick. Many thanks for watching. Goodbye.